Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Beef Cattle Research Council's webinar on improving feed efficiency in seed stock through genomics. My name is Tracy Sackage, and I'll be the moderator of tonight's webinar. I'm the Extension Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council, so my role is to help share information back and forth between researchers, industry experts, and beef producers on research-related topics and tools that can benefit industry. And I'm excited to see so many producers on the line tonight. Uh, 192 people registered, and uh, we've got registrants from all across Canada. We've even got a few international guests on the line. We've got a couple of people from the United States, from England, from Australia, New Zealand, and Uruguay. So welcome to each of you, and uh, we're sure glad to have you on the line. About 60% of you identified yourselves as cattle producers, while the rest are a split between those who work for industry um, and other research organizations, agribusiness, government, and media. As you know, we are recording this session and we'll post the video on our webinar um, at a later date for anyone to view. You'll receive a link to that video in your email from me in a couple of days, along with some supplemental materials to learn even more about tonight's topic. And you can watch this webinar again at a later date, of course. But I also encourage you to take a few notes tonight because that will help you remember some more of the information. So a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, of course, you'll be able to hear and see me and the other presenters tonight, but we can't hear you or see you for that matter. So if you want to communicate with us, you need to type in the small window on the, on the side of your screen there. Um, so if you've got any questions for us or any comments, that's the place to do it. And feel free to send questions in at any time throughout the webinar. We'll answer all the questions near the end of the hour. And partway through the webinar, um, we'll have an audience participation portion. So we'll have some questions for you. There'll be multiple choice questions, and you'll click on your answer to respond, and then I'll share the results live with everyone. But just know that that's anonymous, and your answers um, can't be attributed to anyone. Uh, lastly, I have to share regrets from Tom Lynch Staunton, who unfortunately is not able to join us tonight. Uh, he was suddenly ill and, uh, and unfortunately can't be here. But not to worry, because Dr. John Crowley is, is such a pro, and he's going to cover Tom's slides for us, so the program hasn't changed. So here's what we're going to cover tonight. First, you'll hear an overview of who the Beef Cattle Research Council is, what checkoff dollars pay for, and an explanation of Canada's beef cattle industry science clusters. Next, you'll hear a general explanation on genomics, where the study of DNA sequences in cattle, uh, what it's taught us so far, and where livestock genomics research is expected to go next. Then we'll talk more specifically about cow efficiency and the use of residual feed intake testing. Then we'll open it up to questions from you. And we'll finish the webinar by letting you know where to find more information on tonight's topic and how to be sure you hear about future BCRC webinars. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. Reynold Bergen. Reynold is the Science Director at the BCRC. He's involved in extension, evaluating research proposals and results, and collaborates and communicates with other industry groups, governments, leaders, and media uh, in support of Canada's beef industry. So he's just kind of generally the Canadian beef industry's go-to guy when it comes to all things science-based and research-related. So take it away, Reynold. Okay, thanks. I'm the, the go-to guy, but you still have to find me. All right, so I'm going to give you a bit of a rundown about the BCRC and who we are and what we do and a little bit about the science cluster and then kind of a little bit of background into uh, feed efficiency and, and genomics, but it won't take me too long to get out of my depth on that, so that won't take long. So beef cattle research, you can hear me, right, Tracy? Yep, we can. Well, I'll assume that's a yes. Good. Good. Yes. Okay. So the Beef Cattle Research Council is is Canada's largest industry-funded uh, research funding organization. Our mandate is to fund research that will contribute to the sub competitiveness and sustainability of, of Canada's beef industry. It's been around since the late 90s. 
and we're funded by the national checkoff. So the, there's most provinces have two checkoffs. The the one dollar is the national checkoff, and that goes to support the research that we do, as well as marketing and promotion that that Canada Beef Inc. does. And each of the dollars that that comes to us, we we leverage to against typically government funds to get an extra roughly five or six dollars in in other research dollars. So so it allows us to to turn producer dollars into more dollars and get more research funds. And and each of the uh, the actual funding decisions, the projects and and other funding decisions that we make are actually made by producers. So each of the provincial beef groups, so BC Cattlemen's, Alberta Beef Producers, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's, Manitoba Beef, Fund, uh, beef Farms of Ontario, and then uh, Maritime Beef Council, it, it, each represent their provincial groups and they also are the groups that determine how that national checkoff gets allocated amongst research and, and marketing and it varies from province to province and so based on the number of dollars that each province contributes that determines how much representation they get so so we've got one producer rep from BC four from Alberta three from Saskatchewan and one each from Manitoba Ontario and and the uh, Maritimes um, so a bit of an explanation on this nat this checkoff business because it can be a little bit confusing. Most provinces in Canada pay, you know, a, a roughly three dollars. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, but that's really two checkoffs put together. And one of them is the provincial checkoff, and that funds provincial activities like provincial lobbying with provincial governments and provincial policy development, research activities, marketing, and promotion activities and stuff. The other thing that that funds is the CCA. So actually the CCA, Canadian Cattlemen's, gets funded by provincial um, checkoff and that is uh, the CCA does stuff like national and international programs around advocacy and lobbying and trade and legal stuff and policy and that sort of thing. And so examples of that are the historical battles with RCAF over BSE back in the day and ongoing stuff around cool and, and making sure that the beef industry voice is heard in, in trade negotiations around CETA and TPP and, and Korea and all the rest of it. But we've also got the national checkoff and that national checkoff funds two things. It funds Canada Beef to do marketing and promotion and it funds us to do research. This national checkoff, oddly, does not fund the CCA. The CCA, like I just said, is funded by the provincial activities, so her provincial checkoff. So anyway, hopefully that's clear. You also hear about the beef science cluster. The beef science cluster is uh, partly the government of Canada, Agriculture Canada, through the Growing Forward 2 program and it's them working with us. So we help, we identify what the priorities are and direct the funding and leverage our funding against federal dollars, but it's more than just the two of us. We're the biggest two players, but Alberta Beef is also a major player. They're putting dollars in over and above their provincial and national checkoff. We've got Manitoba Beef is putting cash into it. Beef Farmers of Ontario is investing. So is Alberta Cattle Feeders and even the Quebec Beef Producers Federation, we've got the Grey Wooded Forage Association in Alberta, Pioneer is uh, supporting some, some uh, corn research, and Government of Saskatchewan and, and the Alberta Livestock and Meat Agency as well. So we've got a lot of different funders and players involved in this whole thing. So um, that's what the beef cluster is. We've got a great um, website, as you probably noticed if you're subscribed or you're signed on to this thing, that's probably how you found out. And so stay tuned to that. This is where all our information comes from. You can find out about all the projects we're funding and have funded in the past through there. If you have any questions about that, we're easy to get a hold of. Um, so anyway, we're gonna we got a webinar tonight about half about one thing and half about another thing. Half of it's about feed efficiency. And everybody understands feed efficiency is a really big deal. Feed requirements, especially winter feeding costs, are are hugely important in determining how profitable. Uh, cow-calf enterprises, you know, more efficient cows should have lower wintering costs, should maintain their body condition better, should have be able to raise more cows on the same land base, should have better reproductive performance, and hopefully a better and more uniform calf crop. On the feedlot side, it's, it's one of the biggest influences of profitability there too, um, on the feed-to-gain ratio. 
And the industry's made huge improvements in feedlot feed to gain since the 50s. You know, feed to gain ratio is around 10 or 11 pounds of, of dry feed to get one pound of, of live weight gain. Now it's closer to six to one. So, so it's roughly half as much feed to get a pound to gain. So we're making huge improvements in feed efficiency, but those improvements have come from what we're feeding cattle and how that feed gets processed and how it gets fed and feed additives and growth promotants and just overall better management, it, it really hasn't come very to any great extent through, through breeding. I mean, feed in, intake is a hugely expensive and difficult thing to measure on an individual basis, and, and so it's very, very rarely done. Um, in Canada actually is a world leader in, in this respect, and GrowSafe Systems is a private research and development company just up the road from us, you know, 15 miles in, in Airdrie, and they're, they've got what is probably the most widely used system anywhere in the world. It's, it's used in both commercial feedlots to do private research. It's also used in uh, a lot of research stations around the world. U of A has one of these grow safe systems, and, and they've also got a world-renowned genomics program, and it's called Livestock GenTech. You'll hear more about it. And, and what they're trying to do is, is to identify and validate genetic markers for expensive, hard-to-measure traits like feed efficiency. And the BCRC has been funding genomics research there and at the University of Guelph since 2002. Um, we funded, we're one of many funders that, that contributed to some of the initial efforts to, to sequence, figure out the exact DNA sequence of, of the cattle genome. So, so we've been there from the start. Um, ABP has also funded some of the initial lab um, facilities that they put together. And the Canada Alberta Beef Industry Development Fund actually was responsible for hiring some of the, the world class researchers that, that kicked off that whole program. So, so anyway, it's been going there for about a dozen years, and 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 it's uh, making progress. And we're looking forward to hear John give us an update on on where they're at and where they're going, and how their search for genomic markers for feed efficiency is coming along. Excellent. Thanks very much, Reynold. So if any of you have any questions for Reynold at all, um, again, just type them into that chat box, and uh, he'll be happy to answer them near the end of the webinar. So I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. John Crowley. Uh, so John is originally from Ireland, but luckily for us, he's now working as a geneticist here in Canada. He works with Livestock Gentech, Beef Booster Inc., and the University of Alberta, and is involved in the Genome Canada Project. So please welcome John. John, I think you might be on mute here. We're not hearing you. You got me? Yep, there we go. Good. I'll just turn on my webcam so everybody can see me all right. You looking yeah. good, Tracy? Yeah, looks perfect. All right. So first of all, I guess um, I will send my apologies from my sidekick, uh, Tom and Staunton. He got called. Well, he didn't get called away. He got... Uh, sick all of a sudden this evening and not, not an hour ago he called me while I was on the, the drive on the way up here. Um, you're going to you're gonna have to take my place. So he sent me on a slide so I'm going to take his portion as well as my portion. Um, I said he did a lot of hard work in the slide so I said I'd leave all his slides in and I'll go through them as best as I can and maybe, maybe uh, try and say what he was probably thinking behind the slides but I'm sure I can I can waffle away myself, I'm well used to that. So where we are um, where we are at the moment uh, is with the University of Alberta and we've got a, a little centre here called Livestock Gentech that deals with um, genetics and genomics of of, um, of uh, livestock production. So it was it was formerly called the Alberta Bovine Genomics Program and then we could it, it mainly our main focus was on, on beef. So that was expanded to include dairy and pork. So it's in Alberta Innovates Biosolutions Centre. They are our main sponsors. And the, the whole aim of why it was set up was to look at look at genomics and capitalize on the research that's available to and transfer that out to um, the 
the animal producers of both Alberta and Canada and also collaborate um, worldwide. So these are some of the, the founders here, the, the guy at the top there, um, Dr. Graham Plasto, he's our CEO at the moment, and he, uh, some of the main founders there are Steve Miller, who on the right, who's now in New Zealand, Professor Steve Moore on the bottom right, who's in the University of Queensland, and Dr. John Bazarb and Lelu Guan are both with us here in Alberta, one in the U of A, and one at um, Lacombe Government Research Centre. And there's a whole there's a whole bunch on our, our research team there down the down the left hand side from different places in the world. So that's our research team here, but definitely our re our research centre is a huge collaborative effort, not only with the breed societies and different uh, industry partners in Canada and Alberta, but across the world. We were involved with projects with a lot of countries across the world and different uh, different organisations, both government and private research and breed associations. So where we are in Canada, Alberta, um, a huge, huge agricultural population, a huge, not, I won't say dependence, but a lot of money coming from agriculture, and it's a huge driver of the, the economy here in Alberta and Canada. So what are we good at here in Alberta is, is beef production and protein production, both from the land and animals. So we want to be here a leader in providing genomic solutions for that beef and the other animal value chains to improve the global competitiveness um, of our industry. And we do that by producing the best cattle with the best genetics. And genomics is one of the tools we focus on for this. Of course, when you're talking about animal breeding, there's many different tools um, involved in the, the birth of the animal all the way through to the slaughter of the animal. So genomics is just one of these tools that, that we tend to focus on. Um, when you're producing your animals, how do you want to produce it, and what are your goals? Well, you want to do it um, through uh, an efficient production system. You want to reduce the environmental impact. You want to get more out of your animals. You don't want to have to put more into your animals. So it's really overall production efficiency, not just feed efficiency. Um, you know, the world population is going to hit 9 billion by 2050. That's a huge increase in demand for food, and we're going to have to meet that demand. Um, without actually increasing our, our inputs and do it in an environmentally uh, responsible manner. And of course, with the increase in, in the proportion of the world go moving to the, to the middle classes, the quality of the product is also going, the increase in quality is, is also going to be demanded. And then you start looking at tenderness, marbling, and the, the nutrition aspect of your meat, like looking at CLAs and uh, proper fatty acids. And of course, you want to do all this with healthy animals and look at the well-being and the welfare of those animals. And coming into all of that again is, is food safety and traceability. These are all signals that we're getting back from our, our customers and our producers on how beef and animal uh, proteins need to be produced. And of course, we do it here and in collaboration with our, our people here in Canada and, as I said, worldwide. So as I said, I'm going through Tom's slides here, and I'll try and talk best of what I think he was getting at with some of these slides. I've, I've got a fair idea. But I suppose here he's talking about looking at animal production and how you want to produce the best animal with the resources you're, you have. And that's when we talk breeding, that's defining your breeding goals. And obviously, that's going to depend on where you are and your environment, the time and labor you think you can put into the, your production um, system and obviously the field availability, whether it's all pasture or whether it's a confined to a feed lot or maybe an indoor system. And then that of course leads to the question how do you choose your bulls? Um, well obviously your bulls and your cows, you, I mean you can't, you can't make a calf out of thin air. So you, you first ask what's your optimal cow? Obviously I think your optimal cow is any cow that can produce calf over and over again without costing you a whole bunch and produce a good quality calf. That's an optimal cow. You can say it in one line, and from that line, you can define your breeding goals. Of course, then you say, what's your best bull? And again, your best bull is going to complement your best cow. Cows aren't all going to be the same, so there's obviously no...
Tracy? Hey, John, are you having some trouble with your internet connection? No, no, uh, it just said a few warnings pop up there, but you, you can still hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, now. yeah, you froze for a minute there. So I think you maybe want to just go back to your last slide and then continue on. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I... The best volume slide? Perfect, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what I was just, uh, I'll, I'll recap here, maybe my internet connection dropped for a second. Um, so obviously your best bull is the one that complements your cows and every farmer knows his, his own cows the best himself. So I like, as I said, I like this slide that, that Tom put together here and just reading out that bullet point. Without measuring and tracking our traits over time, how would we know which cow is our best cow? And what he's getting at here is the importance of phenotype recording of your cow herd, of your calves, recording birth weights, weaning weights, and following the calves out of each bull. Now, there's a lot of talk um, in this era of breeding about genomics, but genomics is nothing without the phenotypes recorded on the animal. So genomics isn't a silver bullet. You still have to record your data, and you still have to record all the, all the traits on those animals. So we, we'll just move on to genomics a second and, and kind of look, look at genetics, and this is kind of the area that we're we focus on here at the University of Alberta. So just by definition, genetics is the study of inheritance. And when you do animal breeding, you use the knowledge of genetics or you use the knowledge of inheritance to improve traits of choice or economically relevant traits in your animals. And genomics then is a tool that will aid animal breeding. And uh, genomics, by definition, is a branch of molecular biology which concerns itself with the structure, function, evolution, and mapping of genomes. So that's actually looking at the genetic code, looking at what gene, the function of genes, and how the differences in genes change the differences in, in phenotype. So just a little bit about the genetic code. Just I, I know we have a hugely, hugely mixed audience. So everybody from um, people having their first introduction to this to academics are online. So Bear with us if, if this is all already in your in your head, but we'll, I'll try and go through it as quick as possible. Um, genetic code make up made up of uh, four letters, so everyone has a DNA code, and that determines on what you look like, how good you are at sports, and when you talk about beef animals, you might say whether you are going to produce a lot of muscle, or you're going to be a fatty animal, or in dairy, whether you'll be a good milk producer, or you'll have higher low fertility. Your DNA. The DNA code has a lot to do with how you turn out. So when you look um, in animals, very like humans, the DNA code is about 3 billion base pairs long. So 3 billion of these little letters long. That's, that's, that's a huge, so when we are doing data analysis, that's a huge amount of data to um, interrogate. So out of those 3 billion base pairs, there's about 30 million little changes and they're the little changes in the whole genetic sequence that um, will elucidate differences or will contribute to difference in a phenotype expression. And like a phenotype would be whether it's good for muscling or, or bad for fat or what have you. So we just take a very, very simple explanation there. We have animal one and animal two. We say animal one is good for milk production. Animal two is only average. So when we're doing research, what we do is we measure a whole bunch of phenotypes on the animal. So we measure production, our milk production on, on a thousand plus animals. And we look at all their DNA codes. And we can go into their DNA codes and see where the change is. And wherever there's a change, we, can pop, like we, we go in and investigate that a little more and see if that's the change that attributes itself to higher or average milk production. So that's a very basic explanation of the science. And that little change is called a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. Now, sometimes these SNPs are the actual cause of the phenotypic difference. 
or they can be just a marker. It might be picking up a signal of the actual causes of mutation. Um, I suppose I could talk a little bit about the cost of these. To actually genotype the whole 3 billion actually costs quite a lot of money. It's about 2000 to $4,000. I'm not sure where the cost is today. So what we do to make this economically feasible at a farm level is we just hit on about 50,000 or maybe 800,000. There's two main um, densities that are used for animal breeding. Um, e maybe equally spaced markers along the genome and they pick up the signals if not the cause of the mutation and that's what makes genomics feasible on, on farm. I think in Canada at the moment a 50k test is around 70, 80 dollars to do. So every every so often there's a new organism or or a uh, new yeah new organism genotype. I mean the its DNA code is, is is found out. And back in I think uh, 2009 was when the bovine genome was actually what we we'll say decoded, and that's when the the reference genome of of uh, of what we do now and what we map our 50Ks back to. That's, that's where that came from. And there were people here in the U of A involved in that. And ever since, the cost of genotyping has, has began to decline. Now, so that, that, that's, quite a recent, um, that's a quite a recent development. And when people are asking me about genomics these days, and like, that's where I was driving up from earlier on. I was, um, I was at bull sales and getting a lot of questions down there about how do I get into genomics and how do I get into feed efficiency? And you know, one guy was like, "Is it too late?" And like, "Oh no, the 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 Frisian or the Holstein guys, the dairy guys, have it figured out. Why can't we do it?" And well, it's a little bit different in, in beef because there's so many crossbreds. But this old adage, this Chinese proverb, well, when is the best time to plant a tree? The best time to plant a tree is either 20 years ago or today. So you're never too late to start. You know, you always have to start somewhere. Genomics is a far, far cry from being a, a perfect science and even at a research level we're, we're still only learning about it. So where, where is the genomics future? Well, in dairy cattle, um, because of the very uniform worldwide geno gen genetic structure of the dairy herd worldwide, um, Holstein Friesian would make up a, a huge portion of genetics and because of the, the ready change of genetics between countries, through, mainly through AI and I suppose a bit of embryo transfer as well. Um, dairy were able to, to hit the, not hit the ground running, but make strides in genomic selection very, very quickly because their um, one population was very related to another. In beef, it's not so easy. One, because there's a lot of breeds involved. Two, the ready change of genetics between countries isn't that um, isn't that isn't as large as dairy, and three the huge huge crossbred nature of of the the beef herd. Well, I, I'm definitely speak I'm speaking for Canada there, but I'm sure it's it's the exact same throughout the world. And what we've found as we pursue this genetics or genomics research is taking a pr genomic prediction from one population and validating it in another. Sometimes doesn't work that that well especially with highly polygenic traits. And what I mean by highly polygenic is that there's quite a few different places in the genome that have a response or have a responsibility for the differences in the phenotype. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, how genomics influences genetic gain. And Delta G there on the left hand side of that equation is what we call genetic gain. And that's a function of, we'll, we'll, we'll just boil it down to four major, um, major components. And that's selection intensity. That's maybe, that's like if you select, if you're selecting um, replacement heifers, do you select like the top 10% or do you select the top 20%? Um, the, the accuracy of selection, like if you're selecting on EPDs, how accurate they are has a huge influence on the rate of genetic gain. Obviously, the, the genetic um, variance or the genetic standard deviation of the trait in question and the general generation interval. Um, 
associated with that selection. So genomics actually can target two parts of this equation. One is, you could argue you could target all four, but it'll, it definitely targets two, and that's selection accuracy and generation interval. So how it um, influences the accuracy of genetic selection is, and I have a slide way later on that will explain this better, is a bull must reach two years of age, have progeny, and those progeny must, will say beef, and then those progeny must either go into production or get slaughtered. And it's not until the bull is four years of age that you actually have an accurate proof as to how, what his genetic potential actually is. Um, so that's four years before you actually know for, with a better degree of certainty of how good he'll be. And he might have done a lot of damage by then, or might have done a lot of good. But what genomics can do is you can have an EPD accuracy, or accuracy of a proof on a bull as if he was four years of age at a very, very young age. You can, like, literally when a calf hits the ground, you can um, get a DNA sample from him, you can genotype it, and then you can have a very accurate proof as if he was four years of age um, on that EPD, and that increases accuracy of selection. So indirectly that leads to a decrease in generation interval. Generation interval would be how quickly you would turn over, say, you take your bulls again, how quickly you would turn over your bulls. Um, because you don't have to wait so long to get an accurate proof, you can have your turnover bulls very, very quickly. You might only use a bull for one or two years. You don't have to wait for them to, to get three, maybe two or three calf crops on the ground to see whether he's been uh, lived up to his genetic potential or not. So just that first point there, genome, using genomics increases the accuracy of selection. So how important is accuracy? Well, I, I would call it like a caveat emptor. Buyer beware of, of when you're picking bulls based on genetic merit. And when I say genetic merit, we're talking EBVs, estimated breeding values, or EPDs, um, estimated progeny differences. They're, they're interchangeable. One is half of the other. So pre-genomics, the way accuracy was accrued was through mainly through progeny testing, as you could say. As a bull gets older, he'll have more progeny on the ground, and thus the accuracy on his um, breeding values will increase. Um, accuracy for every, just because you have 10 progeny on the ground doesn't mean the accuracy on the EPD will be 65%. That's just an example. It actually differs by trait, because each trait has a different heritability. It's, it's, um, the variation is explained in different proportions by genetics. Like fertility would be quite a lowly heritable trait. There's, there's, it is genetically controlled, but not to the same extent as, say, feed efficiency would be. Or uh, I could get arguments back about that. They, they say actually fertility is probably controlled to a bigger proportion than we realize. We're just not defining it correctly at a phenotypic level. That's a whole other talk. Um, so when you were talking about EPDs there, and I said the heritability of different traits and the genetic variance of different traits affects the EPD changes, this is maybe a, a good explanation of how accuracy can influence an EPD change. Um, we'll just take weaning weight there. It's a, it's a pretty common trait. So you have an accuracy of 30% on an EPD. Um, that EPD can actually change by plus or minus 8. Now, that mightn't sound like a lot, but all of a sudden you could be picking a bull with a negative um, EPD for weaning weight and you might be going backwards in your selection, where is if you get a bull that's up around 75% accurate, he could only have a change of about plus or minus 0.3, and all of a sudden your accuracy of selection is getting a lot damn closer to, to, where, you want to, to where you want to be. And then that, as I said, that feeds into generation interval, and I, I said I'd speak about it a little bit more. So here's a little diagram of, of uh, how genomics influences generation interval. Um, I just put out two scenarios, dairy and beef. So a bull is born at day zero. At two years of age, probably all going well, his first uh, batch of calves hit the ground. Now, in dairy, he has to wait another two years before the first lactation of his progeny begin. 
So that's when his uh, daughter will start milking for the first time. In beef, those two years, years three and four, are where his progeny are growing, and that's the data you want. You want their weaning weights, and by year four or whenever you, you feel like killing them, that's when the carcass data comes in. So in dairy, it's a little bit longer because it's only in year five that you'll start to be able to collect milk data on that bull. Um, and plus year five is only his maiden heifers. So that's their first lactation, which sometimes is, is, is kind of dirty data. You kind of want subsequent lactations on him. And in beef, you've got another calf crop. So there's about a, you could say there's like a two-year difference in a generation interval. In a uh, in um in beef and dairy. So I think this is the last slide on where accuracy or genomics influences accuracy of selection. Um, so if we have an increase in accuracy in genomics uh, or using genomics, what's that equivalent to? Well, having that genomic proof would be when a calf is born, having a genomic proof would be as if that calf already had 10 progeny. So fast forward four years later. It would be as if that um, it would be as if that bull had a weaning weight um, on 16 progeny. It would be as if he had a yearling weight on 22 progeny and so on. So I'm kind of moving, so that, that's kind of where genomics can help with selection and now I'm kind of going to move into a, a bit of talk about feed efficiency. Um, I might talk a lot more than I actually have slides on but I'm sure there'll be lots of questions at the end in case um, you're confused about anything. So I suppose the most um, well-known trait um, that measures feed efficiency is feed conversion ratio and that's the ratio of dry matter feed intake, and we'll say dry matter intake, to average daily gain. And that's really just how, ma how many kilos the animal puts on to how many it eats. And fair enough, like a perfectly good measure of feed conversion ratio, very, very economically relevant, um, a good biological indicator of feed efficiency. And it's, uh, I suppose, in a feed loss, you can calculate it on a per pen basis. And it's a, it is a good uh, measure and a good indicator of how feed efficient an animal is. Um, the whole reason then, um, I suppose this is the reason why uh, residual feed intake came into the fray, is because it was realized that feed efficiency, feed conversion ratio rather, was probably not a good selection trait, not a good candidate for selection. And that really comes down to the fact, it's a kind of a mathematical um, artifact is that it's a ratio trait and when you select on a ratio trait um, it's just the, the your models put indirectly put more pressure on the trait that has the larger variance so when you look at dry matter intake and average daily gain the coefficient of variation is a lot larger in average daily gain than in dry matter intake so if you select on feed conversion ratio you'll end up with yes you'll get more feed efficient animals but you start pushing your weights a lot, lot more, and you end up with very, very big animals. And while that's a good thing, in one sense, you actually have the maintenance cost of those animals gets quite large very quickly. And all of a sudden, you're maintaining those animals rather than growing them, which is now all of a sudden not economically feasible. Um, also, when you push your, your feed conversion ratio, out of those animals that you're selecting for is going to come your replacement females also. So now all of a sudden you've got big replacement females and um, while she has a calf and while she's milking that calf, she's also quite a big cow and you've got to maintain that cow and that's where a lot of the costs come from increasing mature cow size. So to get over all those scenarios, there was a uh, this is way back in 1963 is when residual feed intake was for the idea for that was uh, first postulated and they wanted a measure of feed efficiency that would indicate that an animal eats less but given that they, there's no change in growth or maintenance requirements or body composition. So when you talk about body composition that's um, 
the, the composition of growth, whether it's fat or lean. So you can define residual feed intake, RFI, by the actual feed intake of an animal, less the predicted feed intake of the animal. So if you predict he, eat, he will eat 10 kilos, and he actually only eats 8, then that's a feed efficient animal, and a more negative value is desirable. Um, <clears throat> what was I going to say? Yeah, so, I can't remember. Oh yeah, so the way we, the, that predicted part there is how do we predict what an animal will eat? Well, we predict what an animal will eat based on what he's growing and what his weight is at a certain time and what his body composition is. So you can see all little um, grow safe bunkers there. These are all uh, measured for feed intake on an individual animal basis over a 120 day uh, test period and over that 120 days the animals are weighed every two to three weeks. They've got an ultrasound body measurement taken or ultrasound back fat taken at the start and in the middle and at the end. So you can put all this information together and you can model the growth of the animal against the maintenance of the animal and include the body conditions measurements of the animal, i.e. ultrasound back fat. And you can get an RFI value, a feed efficiency value on all of these animals at the end. And you can rank your animals based on, on RFI. So this is a slide I, I took from John Bazar, who is a, a researcher with the the uh, Albertan government here in uh, about an hour down the road in Lacombe. So just his quick definition there, it, if you ever hear of the term net feed efficiency, that's also the same as residual feed intake. So just his definition there, feed intake adjusted for body condition or for body size and production. So you take an animal, what he's, he or she is eating, and you basically cancel out the energy sinks and you basically say as if all the animals had the same energy sinks, now who's eating less or more. So it's the difference between an animal's actual feed intake and its expected requirement for maintenance, body weight, growth and changes in fatness. Um, so this trait, when you look at the genetic parameters of this trait, it's, uh, it's fairly well heritable, obviously differ, differs in, in different populations. Um, and when we talk about heritability, heritability by definition is the uh, the proportion of phenotypic variation that can be explained by genetics. So in RFI, the heritability, depending on what population and what study you look at, it has a, a heritability between about 30 and 45%. And it reflects the animal's energy requirement for maintenance. So if you just look at that little graph there, um, that's kind of the spread of RFI values. You'll have, by the, when you calculate it through regression, you'll have a um, a fairly standard distribution with, with the tails going out at the end and uh, you know between about minus 3 and plus 3 is probably where you, you'd see most populations of, of feed efficiency. So when you, uh, when you actually take the most feed efficient animal um, and they eat 3 kilos less a day and the, the, the cost of that over 140 days you can actually average it out that the more feed efficient animals will be about six will eat sixty three dollars less than your the average um, feed inefficient animals. So when you're doing that on and that's just one animal. Now when you're doing that on multiple animals, those costs add up very quickly and all of a sudden feed efficiency is actually shining through as a very economically relevant trait. So that sixty three dollars there, you could term that as the economic value of RFI. So that's the improvement of one unit of RFI. That's how many dollars um, it will give in return, or that's the savings of it. So when we're talking about selecting for RFI, um, how, how do you select for RFI? Or indeed, how do you select for feed efficiency full stop? Well, it doesn't matter what, what um, feed efficiency parameter you use to define feed efficiency. So unless you're testing your animals yourself. I'll, I'll go to point two and three there. If you're testing your animals yourself, unless you have a very, 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 very big operation, um, I won't, I'll take it back a few of those varies. Unless 
you, you should probably do the, the cost benefit of doing this yourself. Now some people have got over it by getting together with their neighbor or two or three neighbors and investing in it like that. Um, but everybody will have a different cost benefit um, seesaw to see where they actually can invest in fee, in fee efficiency testing um, to see the, the return they will get. Um, aside from actually going in and testing your animals yourself, um, and it could be as simple as testing your cows. Maybe you want to breed off your cows rather than your bulls. Um, but without testing yourself, you can buy bulls that have EPD on, on some type of feed efficiency measure. I know the Anguses in the States um, give an EPD for residual gain, I think. I, I'm pretty sure I'm right on that one. Um, the, a, a group I work with here in Alberta, Beef Booster, they give an EPD for residual feed intake. And there's, I think the Herefords here in Canada also give a EPD for residual feed intake, or at least are definitely in, it's in the pipeline to give it soon. So there are a few um, organizations and breed societies coming through with giving EPDs um, for these. Of course, um, as I said earlier, genomics isn't the silver bullet to, in, in um, in animal breeding, and nor is RFI. So, you obviously continue to practice multi-trait selection, but our feed efficiency could be one of the traits you start to keep an eye on. And RFI does slightly different in a, differ in a, a terminal animal versus a maternal. So most of the research in residual feed intake or feed efficiency has been done. Um, in growing animals, and that's what we would say, terminal animals. Now, there, in the last few years, the, the feed efficiency research has taken off in maternal animals, um, your, 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 your cow herd, and there's kind of a repeatability of about 0.7, so uh, you could say the genetic, or, or maybe it's higher, so the gen I think the genetic correlation between, between um, growing RFI and maternal RFI I, I'd, I'd be thinking it's in around the, the 0.7 mark as a genetic correlation. I could be wrong, but I, I'd say that's a fairly safe safe bet. Um, and then when we're talking about multiple trait selection, I, I'm just going to see what my next slide is. Um, I did have a question about, and there's a few studies came out with this, is that if you choose more feed efficient bulls, is that going to impact their fertility? Um, now there have been a few recent papers that have shown unfavorable, we'll say unfavorable correlations between feed RFI and, and scrotal circumference as a measure of male fertility. And that's what the study suggests, they aren't huge um, genetic correlations, but they're there nonetheless. So that is definitely one thing to keep an eye on. Um, that obviously doesn't mean it's detrimental. Um, there will always be enough genetic variation in both of the traits that there will be a feed efficient animal that will also have um, sufficient scrotal. Uh, and that's where you practice your multi-trait selection. Obviously you don't just go on, uh, on feed efficiency. You must practice, you, you feed efficient, but also you must have a better scrotal circumference. So there is enough genetic variation that you can have a bull that's, that's best in both worlds. So now, kind of, I spoke about feed efficiency and I spoke about RFI, and kind of how how do they come together? Well, RFI, or I keep talking about RFI, and that's I when I ever say RFI, I'm referring to feed efficiency, but that, that's just the trait that we're exploring at the moment. So I'll just keep with RFI, but that's what I'm referring to feed efficiency. Um, it's a difficult and 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 relatively kind of an expensive to measure trait. Um, so that's what makes it a good candidate for genomics, is you're, not every farmer is going to go out and measure all their animals or all their bulls for feed efficiency because, of, because it's difficult to, to ascertain that phenotype. So that's why it's a good, um, good candidate uh, trait for genomics. Um, you can measure maybe a seed stock bunch of animals or a cluster bunch of animals that will eventually have a huge genetic influence on another population. And that's how you can trickle down, and that's how you can use genome. That's how you can trickle down your genetics of improved feed efficiency, and that's how you can get a handle um, on the the 
the breeding pattern of those animals is through genomics. So as I said, it can give an increase in accuracy of those EPDs over and above what's available through, through um, pedigree uh, analysis. So these would come in the form of genomically enhanced uh, estimated progeny differences, so GE EPDs. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about those in the next few slides. Um, as I said earlier on, it's a highly polygenic trait, so that's why it's a, it's a good um, candidate for, for genomic research. When you're talking about RFI, the differences between animals for feed efficiency is attributable to a lot of different reasons, and it's different to the digestibility. Um, the activity of those animals, the differences in body composition of those animals, animals that have different feeding patterns, and the heat increment and the protein turnover of those animals, and they're all present in different proportions. And there's another about 25% that's unexplained of, of what the differences are. Um, so kind of at a research level, what we're doing is actually not just defining RFI as a broad term, but actually going delving a little further in and actually looking at the genomics behind protein turnover, behind the activity, behind the feeding pattern, and, and whatever other proportions are, are there. So if you have two animals and they're similar for feed efficiency, say they're both very feed efficient, they could be feed efficient for two different reasons e.g. one could have a lesser heat increment and one could be less active. But yet, they come in the same research population, they come out as being both feed efficient. So then when you're doing your genomics and your genetics and that, you're coming up with kind of antagonisms. You're coming up with markers that are pointing to heat increment and you're coming up with other markers that are pointing to body composition. And all of a sudden, your prediction equations break down when you try and predict in a population where maybe efficiency is attributable to protein turnover. Um, hopefully you kind of got what I was trying to explain there. That was a bit of a ramble. Um, and I also had another question that I, I said I'd address in this. Um, reduced marker panels. Now, when I talk about genomically enhanced EPDs, they're probably more available through um, breed societies. Reduced marker panels are probably not, not if you want to genotype, uh, do a big genotype on your animal. What I refer to by reduced marker panels, well, is there any specific test I can do or a producer can do for feed efficiency? Now, there probably is, but I would, and I, I know there's a lot of the commercial um, tests available. I'm not sure how accurate they are for feed efficiency. If anybody is going out thinking of getting them, I will always ask the service provider how accurate they are. And if you're getting a prediction back, please can you get a, a measure of accuracy with those. And they, I think they, they would be very population specific. If you're getting a reduced marker panel, that's only a few little snips that are trying to pick up the genetic variation of feed efficiency. And I know, we know that feed efficiency is varies in different in different populations in, in genomic structure. So I mentioned there are genomic EPDs. <clears throat> and that's one way to select for improving feed efficiency. Um, so I'm going to continue to talk about producing feed efficiency through a few of these methods, but they're applicable to any other type of trait you can think of. So a genomically enhanced EPD, it does exactly what it says in the tin. It's your traditional EPD, but it's complemented by the genomics. And that's really kind of looking at the pedigree structure at a genomic level and enhancing the accuracy, like getting a, a, relation, a proper relationship between those animals um, at a genomic level and um, giving back a, what we call a blended proof to the, uh, to the breeder. Now, this is delivered back in no different way than uh, a traditional EPD. Um, a lot of people think, like, oh, because genomics is here, they're like, how, how do we use it? How do we get it back? For the commercial, or for the, the, the farmer on the ground, you're probably not going to see any huge difference in the way the information is delivered to you. Now, there's always um, new ways to deliver information, little bar graphs and, and um, uh, little 
bar graphs and diagrams and examples of how accuracies can influence an EPD and stuff like that. Um, but as, as a farmer actually looking at uh, breeding values, there's not going to be a huge way or not going to be a huge difference in what you see back. Um, the real difference is how you use genomics and which animals you test. And that really should will come through uh, working with your breed society or for a commercial guy working with a, a third party, like a university or maybe a, another um, third party company or that offers genomic tests. Um, so a genomically enhanced EPD, you won't notice any real difference in the way it's delivered. There might be a little asterisk next to the bull or a little DNA symbol saying that he's genomically proven. Um, but all you really notice is for those young animals, you'll notice an, an increase in, in accuracy. So these genomically enhanced CPDs, you're going to find them in your sales catalogs, in your AI catalogs. Um, if you do genomics on your own animals, you will see it come up in your own herd profiles. Um, how do you get them? You genotype your animals. And as I said, you work with a breed association or your third party. And again, it's not just for bulls. Your cows can be genotyped as well. Um, as far as I know, I don't think, and I could be proved wrong in this, but I think the, the cost benefit of genotyping beef females is not there yet. It's still more, more cost effective to, to genotype your males in a beef scenario. In dairy, I think it, it, the cost benefit is there to genotype your females. Um, that's the last I heard of that, but that, that was quite a few months ago and things might have changed. So there you're genomically enhanced EBVs. So if you're not part of a, a breed society or you're, you're kind of maybe a commercial producer out on your own and you don't actually get EPDs on your animals, well, there, there's a, an alternative to that and they're kind of molecular breeding values. And I guess these are kind of um, genomic scores, not really using pedigree at all, just using what we know about the animal's genotype. Um, so this is kind of generated through uh, a third party like a university or another another company um, phenotyping a, a huge population, maybe gathering carcass information or gathering feed information, feed intake information, or gathering growth information, and also gathering the, the genotype on those animals and elucidating differences and coming up with kind of a prediction equation um, with for fertility or um, weight or carcass. So you and that's what we call a discovery population, is where you measure the phenotype. So it's your discovery population plus your DNA and all your other phenotypes. And then you can kind of put those together and you can get a genomic proof on a very young animal. But again, the way you receive the information isn't going to be hugely different. You're still going to see where each animal ranks relative to another. You're going to see where it's good or bad for, for a certain trait. And Again, I, I know this is, um, I suppose, a trait of, of, of choice or a trait of interest we're talking about here is feed efficiency. But again, this goes for, for most traits. So where can you find the molecular breeding values? Well, again, indicated in your sales and AI catalogs. And how do you get them? Well, the, they're produced by maybe some genotyping companies or there's an opportunity for breed associations to follow pure red bulls that they sell out into the commercial population and they could track them there and I have a point there, make sure you know how to read them, like you have to make sure that whoever is giving you the breeding values, you're not comparing them to some other population that's not relative to, to where these are coming from. And then I, I said I'd throw in this slide here and this is kind of a another use of genomics and it's marker assisted management. Um, just two, two kind of things there that I didn't throw in, and it's maybe you could take examples from the human side. Um, human genomics is kind of you know going down the road of maybe personalized medicine and personalized nutrition and looking at risk factors of different diseases um, through genotyping. And that's kind of where kind of the macro assisted management is, is getting to, or getting at rather. It's, it's, it's at a very research orientated level at the moment and it's kind of a bit of a way off. But you know, you can use your if your your knowledge of the gene type of an animal to maybe manage it better, give it a better give it a more appropriate diet, um, 
uh, give it a more like maybe it's resistant to something that you don't have to vaccinate for. So these are little ideas that we're kind of pursuing at a, at a research level at the moment. But where genomics can help with market system management at the moment is um, is things like parentage. You know, you've got a multi-sire pasture and you know, you've got a whole bunch of calves that are doing really, really well and you want to know, well, which sire had those calves because um, you might want to keep him and not cull him or you might want to go back to your, your bull guy that you bought him off and say, give me more of his line or give me more of his family. So that's kind of where parentage can, can add a lot to your, to your breeding goals. And again, you might want to keep an animal. Also, you might want to find out if there's a huge inbreeding problem. I had a guy at a bull sale today, he wanted to know whether he had an inbreeding problem or whether some of his genetic defects or his, his birth defects, or we won't call them genetic defects, whether they were caused to um, lupin um, that was growing on his, his rangeland. So, you know, I said, the damage is done this year, unfortunately, but going on next year, you know, next time you put your hand on your bulls, take a DNA sample, and if it happens again next year, we'll be able to genotype those um, deformed calves, and we'll be able to, to point out the problem. And then that goes down to, that might be an inbreeding problem, but it also might be, uh, um, one of those bulls might be carrying a re, uh, lethal recessive. And, um, you know, I was looking up a few pictures for the slide, and all of a sudden, as I looked up different, uh, different conditions, some of those pictures became hard to look at some of them, so I only put up two of the milder ones. Um, and again, single gene tests can go as far as horn pole tests and, uh, and coat color. So this is a, this is a slide here from um, Alison Van Eneman. She's at the, the University um, in, in California, UC Davis. And uh, she, I, I like this slide because this, this shows especially in a presentation like this where we have a lot of different people in the audience. This is kind of shows where genomics can have an, a an application at different um, links of the supply chain and in, in different capacities. So you've got guys like the seed stock guy, the commercial guy, the feed lot and the processor and they're probably the most four distinct areas of the beef production chain. Um, so seed stock and commercial can use it in a lot of similar ways for DNA um, assisted selection, parentage, recessive, allele testing, control of inbreeding, mate selection, and DNA assisted management. Probably the only one I hadn't previously mentioned was mate selection. Um, you know, as a feedlot guy, definitely DNA assisted management. If you want to split up your animals based on fast and slow growing on different diets, that can be done as well. And then for the, produ or for the processor, DNA based purchasing and definitely traceability, which is coming a, a huge, huge point of interest. Um, I think this is probably one of my last slides. I kind of mentioned it earlier on, but I, I'll reiterate it again. While, while we're in the age of genomics and we're doing a lot of, um, lot of work on the genotypes of the animal, we, we, need, we still need to keep collecting the phenotypes to be able to match the two together. Um, as generations progress and as we breed, if we stop collecting phenotypes back here, and the further we get away from them, all of a sudden your genotypes way out here aren't that relevant anymore. So we have to keep up with our phenotype testing as well. And that's nearly more important now because it's quite easy to get a genotype. It's quite easy to go out and get a, a tissue punch in, of the ear or a hair sample or a blood sample or a semen sample and, and get a DNA, uh, get a genotype on that. The, nearly the more difficult part now is the, is the phenotype collection. And I guess there's a whole you know, side to that we call phenomics is looking at easier way to measure um, how to get our phenotypes or those phenotypes that take a long time to, uh, to measure, like those traits like carcass traits, you only realize once an animal has been sacrificed or female fertility, you have to wait till the end of her lifetime to be able to see her longevity or her survival. So phenotypes are important and for recording those phenotypes, there's a lot of different softwares out there. I know a lot of people do their own um, Excel spreadsheets, but you know you should talk to your your party of interest or who looks after you, or maybe you've got a local breeding group or a local management group. And you know, I, I definitely suggest looking at some uh, some data management softwares. So that kind of um, 
that kind of brings me to to the end of the the science and the, the sciencey part of it. I'm just going to have two slides here and a little plug. We've got our own at the University of Alberta here in Livestock GenTech. We hold a little conference every year, and well, it's not little; it's actually growing every year. And this year is going to be another good year. Um, August 12th to 14th. So put that dates in your calendar. It's up here in Edmonton, and the last day of it, there'll be everybody from science guys to to producer speaking, and the last day of it is um, a, is a trip to the Kinsilla Ranch, the University of uh, Alberta Ranch, um, celebrating a, a, in a, an anniversary of Dr. Roy Berg, who was the the pioneer of crossbreeding here in Canada, and he took a lot of flack in the early days about touting the merits of crossbreeding. And he was up here at the University of Alberta, and sadly he passed away. That's a long ago, but he's, uh, he's, he's well remembered up here, so we're going to have a field day to remember him up here on, on August 13th. So everybody's more than welcome to that. And if you go on to livestockgentech.com um, or swing myself or Tom an email, or emails there on the title slide if, if, you, if you have it, and, um, or, go, or go to the University of Alberta website, you can find details on how to register there. So I'm going to... I'm going to wrap it up there, and uh, thanks very much for your attention, and uh, Tracy. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, John. So what we're going to do now is we are going to ask you all in the audience a couple of questions. Uh, I've got a couple of multiple choice questions here for you that I'm going to put up on the screen one at a time. Uh, you'll have about five or ten seconds to click on your answer, and then we'll share the results with everyone. Um, again, these are anonymous. We, uh, we can't attribute the answers to anyone. So, first question here. <coughs> Do you consider EPDs or selection indexes when selecting AI sires or buying bulls? So you can select all that apply, um, whether or not you consider those with commercial bulls um, and with purebred bulls. So you can go ahead and vote there, and I'll give you a couple more seconds here to get your answers in. Okay, I'll share the results here. So it looks like 73% of you said that you do consider them with purebred bulls uh, and over 50% with your commercial bulls. And so let's move on to the second question. So our next poll question. How do you track your calves after weaning? Do you background or finish your own calves at home? Do you retain ownership and custom feed them? Do you sell them direct to a feedlot? Do you participate in BIX, which is a, a Canadian software system here, or another information sharing program? Or do you sell them at weeding and you're not sure where they go? You can go ahead and click on all that apply to you. I'll give you about five more seconds to get your answers in. Okay, let's share the results. So 54% of you background or finish your own calves at home. And then 38% of you sell them at weaning and you're not sure where they go. 22% 20, uh, sell direct to a feedlot. 19% participate in BICS or another information sharing program. And 14% retain ownership and custom feed. Okay, last question. Have you ever used an RFI tested bull? So if you've um, bought an RFI commercial or purebred bull, it's the first two options there, um, or let us know whether you've AI'd using an RFI tested bull, or if you've never used one. It's been RFI tested. Okay, let's see the results. 74% of you have never used an RFI tested bull, but 18% of you have AI'd with one, 11% of you um, have AI'd with a commercially, uh, commercial bull that's been RFI tested, and what 8% have bought either an RFI tested commercial or purebred bull. 
Okay, so that's kind of it for the audience participation part there. Um, now you're welcome to ask any of the presenters here questions. If you've got questions for either of them, just type them into that box there. And we've got a few here in already. So let me just open up the first one here. So first question is, what is the best sample, such as hair or blood, etc., to use as a sample to study an animal's genome? So maybe, John, if you want to start with that. Um, I, guess, I guess blood would be the, the most favored sample. Um, one, because you can extract DNA from it quite easily, plus there's probably a lot of the sample left over in case the genotype doesn't work first time around. Um, having said that, it's kind of a trade-off between what's easier to get also. Trying to get blood out of an animal is, is a lot more difficult than getting a hair sample. Um, probably just the one, I'll tell you, the one to stay away from would be um, a nasal swab. We seem to get a lot of contamination of different bugs in a nasal swab and we end up uh, genotyping the little bacteria as well as the animal's DNA and it gets a little messy. Okay, next question. Will heifers with a low RFI, and therefore R efficient, be efficient as cows on pasture or only when they are actively growing? Good question. Um, and that's definitely something that's being produced uh, are pursued at a research level at the moment. Um, initial, uh, uh, initial outcomes say, yeah, yes, they'll be more efficient. There will be some re-ranking. It's not a 100% correlation, but it, the tendency is for the more feed efficient growing heifers to be the more feed efficient growing cows. And is any genomic research or RFI being done on rare breeds of cattle in Canada? If so, is there any funding available to breed associations or producers to help with those costs? Um, I suppose if we we'll, we'll kind of redefine uh, rare breeds or, or smaller breeds, yes, there's, there's a few people that have, a few groups that have approached us at the university um, and we're more than, we're, we're looking into ways of maybe getting them all together as a group rather than just pursuing, pursuing it um, breed by breed. Um, and there's a few funding opportunities available, yeah. So, again, drop us an email if, if you're a part of a, a rare breed or a smaller breed and interested in pursuing either feed efficiency or, or, or genomics research, and there's funding opportunities available, yes. Okay, this question is for Reynold. Um, are there any projects in the second cluster examining feed efficiency with or without genomics component? Yeah, we've got quite a few, actually. Um, so we take a really broad view of feed efficiency. Feed efficiency is, is improved availability and, and usefulness of the feed. So, so we're funding a number of projects. We've got one big project on barley breeding, right? So simply trying to improve the yield and the, the agronomic traits of, of feed barley. Um, we've got um, some research going on with U of A with, with the group that John Crowley works with, and that'll be a really interesting one because that'll answer, I think, uh, some of the questions that are probably circulating in a number of people's heads here now about how, if we're selecting for feed efficiency in in growing cattle, how is that going to impact the the performance of that animal through its lifetime, but also in the cow herd as a, as the cows um, mature, how how does it you know, manifest it in manifest itself in those cows in in terms of their overall functionality. So so their their uh, intake and behavior and behavior and whatnot, but also um, you know just production traits, birth weights and and weaning weights and all the rest of it, longevity. So so that's one. Um, and then a number around feed processing and different forages and 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 whatnot at uh, with Agriculture Canada and Lethbridge. And then we've also got a project with uh, Greg Penner at the University of Saskatchewan, and, and and what he's doing is trying to figure out what it is about the guts of the animal and how they work and all the different enzymes and and you know receptors and, and cells that do absorbing and whatnot. How how those interact to to determine whether an animal's efficient or not. So and and uh, 
fellow in Nova Scotia, actually, Yuri Montanoli, who's somebody that we trained through the first cluster, with Steve Miller. He's a professor out there now, and he's doing a bunch of work as well, trying to, you know, kind of take that black box apart and figure out what it is that, that makes one animal more efficient than another. So what's really cool, I think, is that the, the stuff that, that Yuri in Nova Scotia and, and Greg Penner in, in Saskatoon are going to come up with is they're going to figure out kind of what are the what are the different genes that are getting expressed in those animals and and ultimately what that can do is is help people like John and people at Gentech to figure out what are the DNA markers you need to look for to to, to find really uh, like more and and more reliable markers for feed efficiency. How was that? <laughs> So actually a little bit further to that, a little bit more specific, um, is it true that feed efficiency is counterproductive to beef quality? Asking me? Sure, you want to tackle it first? Well, I can take a shot at it. Um, there's some... I haven't read this recently, so I have to think about it. There's reasons to think that they could be associated. So if a really efficient animal is efficient because it's growing really fast and putting on a lot of muscle, it may there may be concerns around tenderness just because of the way it's depositing so much protein. Um, you know, whereas an animal that, that is less feed efficient might have more t protein turnover all the time and might be just, you know, more inclined to breaking it down on a regular basis. So, so there, there may be reasons to be concerned, but it's, I think, a little bit more theoretical than, than actual, you know, evidence to that effect. Would, would you agree with that, John? Yep, bang on. Um, and then, because that th that's theoretical and maybe some of the, the early research looking into that um, if there is a difference found, can the human, can us, can we as as tasters actually pick up on that difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just it, it, might, it might be big enough for us to pick it up. Yeah, because just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean that the ordinary consumer can notice it. Okay, so next question. Uh, so for John, is feed efficiency related to the leptin or TT gene because of uh, the difficulty to measure the trait? Um, yeah, there is some, some people swear by it. Other people are skeptical about it. Um, from a biological and research point of view, I mean, uh, it, it could have a, a lot to do with it, but because that gene is fairly well um, known about in different populations, um, I'd say that it probably has either different influences in different breeds or different populations because we don't really see it shine through when we do our research. But it, it, it does pop up when we do a genome-wide association study. It does have an influence, but you could you would wonder is it picking up actual metabolic or underlying um, biological feed efficiency or is it picking up um, something to do with, with growth? Okay, so we've got five more questions here and then I think we'll wrap things up for tonight. Uh, okay, so next question. Is there any use of dried blood cards for genotype work in livestock species in Canada? Any labs and where? Dried blood cards. Um, I got asked. I I hate to say it, but I think it's very difficult to get it from dried blood cards. Um, if that person definitely wants to get back to me on that question, they can, and I will ask. Or we have a service lab in here in Edmonton that are is kind of our um, service arm called Delta Genomics, and I'd be more than happy to pass that question along. Um, but I think it's quite difficult to get DNA, but it might be a lost cause, depending on how much blood is on that card. Okay, next question. Is there a breed that shows more consistency on genomic trait selection uh, than others? Uh, I get, yeah, yeah, Holstein. Holstein. I guess it, 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 de it definitely uh, depends on the, the, the argument. The organization structure and the way they pursue genomic selection. So, 
nearly your bigger breeds with your biggest references populations and biggest genotype databases, they're the people that are obviously performing well without naming names. Okay. Um, are we any are we near to any shoot side tests on some trait selections? At a genomic level, I presume. Your your meaning? Yeah, so you could um so that's that's very akin to um bedside tests in humans. Um no, I we're not close to it yet and I don't know how far away that is. That's really um you know, getting a spot of blood, running through a little meter, and getting like a genome profile. That's like that's kind of the dream. That's nearly what we're all pursuing, and that's actually a very, very good question, and uh, very creative. But th that's kind of where some of us, if we're sitting around having a beer, that's what what we kind of fantasize about. But no, not close to it yet. Okay, we're gonna do two more questions. Uh, again, for John, do you know if animals with low RFI uh, fed a certain diet, for example, high forage, can have the opposite response, har high RFI, when fed a different diet? Um, not opposite, but less efficient than pre on the previous diet, yes. So there was a bit of research done here at the U of A on giving animals a grower and a finisher diet, and the animals that ranked high for on the, on the on the finisher diet, always ranked high on the, on, rather ranked high on the grower diet, always ranked high on the finisher diet, but there was no, none of the animals switched from high to low efficiency. Okay, and then the last question that we're going to ask tonight, um, I know that there's more on there, so, you know, apologize that we didn't get a chance to get to your questions tonight. Um, I, Lights just Lights went out, out in our office, which you can all see, but that's okay. Trying to tell us something. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> um, if you've got more questions out there, please don't hesitate to send those in. We'll do the best we can to get back to you. But uh, last one that we'll ask here tonight is, uh, will particular genetics identified as more uh, feed efficient be manifested on either predominantly fiber or forage diets? That's for me. Uh, yeah. So I guess it depends on where they where they were initially measured. Um, you know that 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 is a, a a source of research, and that that's what a lot of people are looking at at the moment. Do indeed animals perform well on forage and on on grain diets? The the little hang up with that piece of research is you've got to test an animal on different diets at different stages of its life and some differences in um, in differences in feed efficiency measured on, on grass and in, on grain may be attributable to differences in ages. So usually we say a feed efficient animal will be feed efficient in, in most environments but again we're, we're, we're researching that at the moment. Ren might have a comment on that actually. No, I, I think it's probably pretty related to, to your answer to the previous question about yeah. whether animals re-rank. Yeah. So it, this is probably a gross oversimplification, but I'd say if an animal can is you know able to gr get fat on forage, it's probably going to get fat on grain right? and vice versa. If you can't get fat on grain, you won't get fat on forage. I suspect a lot of that has to do with how efficient they're, they're using those nutrients. Perfect. Well, thank you. Okay, so the last few things here. Um, you know, if you'd like to hear more from the Beef Cattle Research Council, including hearing about our future webinars, be sure to sign up to our email list. Just go to our website at uh, www.beefresearch.ca and click on that subscribe button. If you've got a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube account, you can certainly find us there. And I know that uh, a lot of you on the line tonight have been live tweeting throughout the webinar, which is uh, which has been great. And um, you know, I'd also encourage you to go to the Canadian Cattlemen's Association um, website, which is cattle.ca, and sign up for their newsletter called Action News. 
I want to give a very big thank you to Dr. Reynold Bergen, uh, Mr. lynch Staunton, and Dr. Crowley for volunteering your time and expertise to make tonight's webinar possible. Uh, a big thank you to a couple of the people who have been a big help to me behind the scenes here um, to get this webinar going. And that's uh, Karen Schmidt, Jacques Buchanan-Smith, and uh, Janice Bruno, who was a big help in, in previous webinars. After the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a short survey that asks what you thought of tonight's webinar and what you're most interested in hearing about for future webinars. We need your feedback to do the best job that we can to deliver information that's useful and meaningful to you and helps you make informed decisions on what's best for your herd, your land, and ultimately your bottom line. So please do take the time to uh, complete that survey and don't hesitate to contact us at the BCRC at any time with questions or comments. We, we certainly appreciate those. Again, you'll receive an email from me in a couple of days with a link to the recording of tonight's webinar, as well as some additional information on tonight's topic. And that's it. So thanks again for your interest. Um, we're going to take a break for the summer months in terms of webinars, and so we'll resume our webinar series come the fall, and so hope to see you back on the line then. And uh, yeah, thanks again for your interest, and good night. All right. Thank you. Hey.